Years ago, as a much younger man, I was a chaplain with a group called Good News Mission, and their main ministering thrust was to reach inmates, uh, people who were incarcerated in jails and prisons throughout the United States. They had an office in the Orange County Jail in Orlando, Florida, and that's where I was assigned at the time. And my one of my main objectives, of course, was to preach the gospel and teach the gospel to as many inmates as I could. And I would then pray and trust that the Lord would open their understanding and draw him to, their self, to himself through the Holy Spirit, and they would be uh, believe this and be able to understand and accept it. Well, I found that talking to inmates wasn't really too much different than talking to people who were free and not incarcerated. Uh, the only difference was the inmate had acted upon his sin nature, had committed crimes, had been caught after committing those crimes, uh, gone to uh, court and been found guilty and, and judged and sentenced and were serving their time. Uh, oftentimes when I go into churches, people would say, Chaplain, what's a murderer look like? And I'd pause and think real hard and say, you know what? A murderer looks exactly like you. The point being, <laughs> I was trying to get across was that any of us, uh, you, me, that person, anybody, uh, given the right situation at the right time, could, could be capable of murder. So anyway, in those days, whenever I did talk to someone about the Lord, I usually tried to find something that I could relate to or identify with that person. And I often found that one of the best stories in the Bible that seemed to relate better to the inmates than, than other stories was the story about Paul and Silas when they got thrown in jail in the book of Acts. So I would pull an inmate from a cell, take him to my office, which was just a converted jail cell, and uh, I'd ask him, have you ever heard the story of two men in the Bible who were thrown in jail on trumped up charges? And that always got their attention, and most of the time they would say, no, I haven't, but uh, sure, I'd like to hear it. And so I'd tell them this story here, and I'd turn to the book of Acts. Paul and Silas, two men, were in the city of Philippi, which was a chief city in the region of Macedonia, and they had spent some days there, and they were having a pretty successful ministry teaching and preaching. And one day, when they were on their way to prayer, they were met by this woman who was demon-possessed. And uh, she uh, had earned a lot of money for her masters as this demon-possessed woman, telling all these divinations and so forth. And she cried out after them in a real loud voice, These men are from the Most High God, and they bring us the way of salvation. And I often wondered, well, wonder why this demon-possessed uh, woman, or the demon would would say such a thing as that, because that was true. And the only thing I could ever think of was if today uh, in church on Sunday morning with everybody all dressed up and things nice and, and the choir there and the preachers preaching and some disheveled, uh, smelly-looking, dirty, filthy person with uh, bloodshot eyes and this demonic, crazed look about him cried out, He's right! Listen to him! Well, who needs help like that? Anyway, uh, we read in the book of Acts, as we went to prayer, it happened that a certain girl, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much gain by divining. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who are announcing to us the way of salvation. And as she did this many days, but being distressed and turning to the demonic spirit, Paul said, I command you, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And it came out in that hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their game went out, they, having seized Paul and Silas, they dragged them to the market before the rulers. Or in other words, they had them arrested by saying some things that weren't entirely true, and but these things were nevertheless held a real popular belief by the people. And we read that bringing them near to the judges, they said, these men, being Jews, are exceedingly troubling our city. They're nothing but troublemakers, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, nor to do, being Romans. And the crowd rose up against them. They had the will of the people behind them, and tearing off their clothes, that's Paul and Silas's clothes, the judges tore their shirts so that when they were flogged and beat it went against their bare skin, they ordered them to be flogged. Now, flogging was actually to be beat with rods and each whack with the rod left more than a weld. It would leave a great deep gash or cut on their backs. Um, and the crowd liked that back then. 
so as I told this story to the inmates and we talked about it, they always had opinions about police brutality and issues that were related to that. They always seemed to get progressively more and more involved in the story and get into it. And they were able to relate to Paul and Silas, who were, had been beaten by the authorities. And we read then, after laying on them many stripes, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a command, thrust them into the inner prison, made their feet fast in the stocks. So here was Paul and Silas, not only beaten, but uh, thrown in jail without any trial whatsoever, into solitary confinement and maximum security, and they put their feet in stocks, which were tortures, uh, instruments of torture as well as confinement. Sometimes their feet were spread far apart of their legs were to inflict pain while they were in these stocks. So I then asked the inmate, well, here's Paul and Silas in this situation. If that happened to you, what would you think? What would you do? And believe me, believe you me, I often heard exactly what they thought and felt. And I, it, some of it was so <laughs> rated that I just can't repeat it in a video Bible study. But to say the least, these inmates would get very into this and be angry. So I went on to read to them exactly what Paul and Silas did in that situation. And invariably, they were shocked. Toward midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and praised God in a hymn, and the prisoners listened to them. So at midnight they started praying, and this led to singing hymns, and their backs were bleeding, their feet were in these torture instrument stocks, and they were in this dark, damp cell, and they were singing praises loud enough for the other inmates to hear them, and then a miracle happened. There was an earthquake, the foundations of the prison were shaken, the doors flew open, their bonds fell off, and we read there was the same thing, there was a great earthquake, and being awakened and seeing the doors of the prison being opened, drawing a sword, the jailer was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. He saw the doors open and his obvious conclusion was, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Rather than face the, the torture and punishment I'm going to get, I'm going to take my own life. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, we're all here. Then asking for light, he rushed in, that's the jailer, fell trembling. He was so shook up, he was actually shaking before Paul and Silas. And leading them outside, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He wanted to know what the to-do list was. And what was their answer? Invariably, the inmates would give me uh, all kinds of answers. Things like, be good, that's probably what Paul told him. Or go to church, or read the Bible. Some would even say, quit drinking, quit smoking, quit whatever. Uh, help other people. Believe in God. And they were always surprised when I read the very next verse uh, of Paul's answer back to the jailer. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, as well as your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his household. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is believe. And when I told the inmates that, it just floored them. And I explained to them, well, here's the word of the Lord spoken of simply as the gospel. And then I go on and explain to, to them that we, you, me, all of us, we're just sinners. Uh, I usually wouldn't get too much objection from inmates on that issue there. Uh, then I explained to them, God is holy and God is righteous and he's perfect. And so he's bound by his own character of holiness and righteousness and perfection to judge sin. But then enters God's love, and he loves us, the sinner, you and me, so much that he decided to put Jesus Christ, his only son, in our place to die for and pay for our sins. Our sins were placed on him, and then he gave us, Christ gave us his righteousness. And the Bible definition of the gospel is actually found in 1 Corinthians 15. Brothers, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you. And then verse 3 goes on to say, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And as I explain to this, I usually try to use a little illustration. I describe a cliff us on one side, uh, and God's in his righteousness on the other, 100 yards across, five miles deep. Some people could run and jump maybe five yards, some 10, some 20, some maybe even 30 yards, but everyone would eventually fall short of God's glory. Then I would just simply explain to him that Christ has bridged that gap. It's his righteousness, his goodness, 
his what he's done for us not anything we can do that will get us to heaven it's Christ plus nothing so I know I'm going to heaven not because of what I've done or haven't done or how good I've been or haven't been but because of what Christ has done for me this is the record that God has given to us everlasting life this life is in his son he who has the son has life he who does not have the son of God does not have life and God says I've written these things to you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have the everlasting life and inmates often responded to this and that truly is good news